good evening. And since this is our first program of 1996, I hope it's not too late to wish you all a very happy new year. This evening, and for the rest of the week, you may be able to catch sight of the little planet Mercury low down in the southwest after sunset. Actually, it's quite bright when you find it, but it's never conspicuous because we never see it against a dark background. And telescopically, all you see, I think, is the characteristic phase. Mercury, in fact, goes around the sun once in 88 days, and when it's almost between the Earth and the sun, what we call inferior conjunction, its dark side is turned towards us, and we can't see it at all. And that next happens on January the 18th, and so for a bit around that, that time, Mercury is going to be out of view. Only one space probe has passed it, that's Mariner 10, a long time ago now, in the 1970s, and sent back pictures showing a rocky, cratered landscape, not too unlike that of the Moon. But Mercury has virtually no atmosphere, and I think the chances of going there in the foreseeable future are, quite frankly, nil. But if Mercury is elusive, the second planet, Venus, is anything but that. And Venus is now coming very nicely into view in the western sky after sunset, shining so brightly it looks almost like a small lamp. Now, that's a sketch I made some time ago when Venus was half phase. And I show you that one because only around about that time can you see anything definite at all. And even there, I have definitely exaggerated the markings, but I had to. Venus, like Mercury, shows phases. And at this time, the rotation period around the Sun is 225 Earth days. So let's see what happens. When Venus is at inferior conjunction, the dark side is turned towards us, and we can't see it at all. Then as it moves along, a little of the light side began to turn towards us. You know, the crescent, then a half, then three quarters, and then full. But of course, when Venus is full, it's on the far side of the sun and out of view. Then it becomes gibbous again, or three quarters, and it's like that now, then half. And over the next few months, it'll become gradually a crescent and then return to inferior conjunction. It's about the same size as the Earth, and it has been passed by various probes. The latest, of course, was Magellan, which went round and round Venus, sending back amazing pictures. Venus is covered with a dense atmosphere, and we can't see through it, but radar can. And there's a radar picture of Venus from Magellan, showing what Venus would look like if it were stripped of its atmosphere. And we now know that on the surface there are huge volcanoes. Look at those, they're quite amazing things, and they are probably active. But Venus, although about the same size as the Earth, our twin, is definitely a different kind of world. The atmosphere is mainly carbon dioxide. The atmospheric pressure is crushing. The temperature is very high, nearly 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And the clouds contain a great deal of sulfuric acid. So I'm afraid, <coughs> as a possible colony, Venus must be disregarded. We must observe Venus from a very respectful distance indeed. The other planet on view now is Saturn. And you'll see that in the south after dark, Below the stars, the square of Pegasus, and Saturn shines like a rather bright star. And of course, Saturn is the planet with the rings, and usually the loveliest thing in the entire sky, but not at the moment. The rings are nearly 170,000 miles long, but less than a mile wide. And when they turn edgewise onto us, as they are at the moment, happens every 15 years or so, they almost disappear. So at the moment, you will only see Saturn's rings, telescopically, as a very thin line of light. And not until next year will Saturn again resume its customary beauty. So much then for the planets. Now let's come to the stars. And we'll begin with our old friend, the marker, Ursa Major, the Great Bear, the Plough, whatever you call it. And the Great Bear is always on view whenever the sky is clear and dark. It's so near the pole, it simply goes round and round without setting. It's what's called a circumpolar star. You see the pole star there too. And on the other side, the W of Cassiopeia. And it's interesting, you know, to take an ordinary camera and uh, turn it toward the pole on a dark night and give a time exposure. And when you do that, by virtue of the Earth's rotation, the stars will seem to trail across the plate, and that's the kind of picture you'll get. Very interesting, and you might even grab a meteor or two. I may say the pole star itself is a very luminous star, something like 6,000 times brighter than our sun, and about 700 light years away. It's not exactly at the pole, uh, about one degree away, and it won't be nearest to the pole until March 2100, because the pole of the sky does shift very slightly. And to find the pole star, well, that's very easy. Go back to the Great Bear and use the two pointers, Dupe and Merak, and they show you the way to the pole star. Very simple indeed. And if you look at those two pointers, Merak and Dupe, you will see they are not the same. Merak is a pure white star, so it's pretty hot. Dupe is orange in color. You can see that with the naked eye, and binoculars bring it out well. And that indicates that Dupe's surface is cooler than that of Merak, and for that matter, cooler than that of our yellow sun. 
But all the same, Dupi is a powerful star, 60 sun power, and 75 light years away. So we see it now as it used to be 75 years ago. Also in Ursa Major, in the tail of the bear, there is Mizar, the most famous double star in the sky. Look carefully, and you'll see a much fainter star, Alcor, close beside it. Use a telescope, and you'll see that Mizar itself is made up of two. And here's a low-powered telescope field, the two Mizars in the top, and Alcor on the other bottom. Those other faint stars are not connected. And the two Mizars really do make up a connected or binary system, and they're going together around their common center of gravity, though they are a long way apart, and the revolution period is very long indeed. On the opposite side of the pole star, with respect to the Great Bear, is Cassiopeia, the W of Cassiopeia, which again never sets over Britain. In mythology, Cassiopeia was a proud queen, a, a lady in a chair, seen there, I'm afraid, in a rather undignified sideways-on position. But two of the stars in the W are very interesting. The middle one has the name of its own, made it called Gamma Cassiopeia, and that's an unstable, variable star. Normally, just a bit fainter than the pole star, but sometimes it throws off shells of gas and brightens up to magnitude one and a half, as I remember it did way back in 1937. You can compare it with its neighbor, Shedia, or Alpha, which is another orange star, probably very slightly variable. And the third main star of the W is Shafe, and that's a white star, which is non-variable. So interesting to look at those three stars and see which is the brightest of them. But close to Shafe, there's a very interesting star indeed. It's called Rho Cassiopeia, and that's a very powerful star, probably something like 200,000 times more luminous than our sun, and of course, a very long way away. And it's a variable. We're not quite sure what kind of a variable it is. Normally, it's about magnitude 5. We can see it with the naked eye. And you can compare it with two stars to either side of it. But sometimes, it drops down in brilliancy, and then you need binoculars to see it. So altogether, Rho Cassiopeia is a very strange star indeed. There it is, indicated by the arrow. Compare it with the two stars to either side. As I've said, uh, in mythology, Cassiopeia was a proud queen. Her husband was King Cepheus, and there is Cepheus, but I'm bound to say that in the sky, Cepheus is much less conspicuous than his wife. And the stars in Cepheus, which adjoins Cassiopeia, are really rather vague. But there's one very important star there, again with no proper name, we call it Delta Cephei. And that's been of immense value to astronomers. Way back in the year 1783, it was studied by a strange astronomer named John Goodrick, who was deaf and dumb, but nothing the matter with his eyesight or his brain. In fact, there's an observatory now named after him in his hometown of York. And Goodrick discovered that Delta Cephei is variable. It doesn't shine steadily, as most stars do. It brightens and fades, brightens and fades, in a period of five days, and it's absolutely regular. And nowadays, we found other stars which behave in the same way, and we call them Cepheids after Delta Cephei. But the important point is this. Much, much later, it was found that the period of a Cepheid is linked with its real luminosity. Therefore, if we measure the period of a Cepheid, we can find out how luminous it is, and once we know how luminous it really is, we can find out its distance. And since Cepheids are powerful stars, they can be seen over vast distances, we see them in other galaxies, and so they act as, ma as magnificent standard candles in the universe, and Cepheids are of paramount importance for astronomers. There's one other interesting variable in Cepheus, and this is Mu Cephei, very much fainter and very red. In fact, Sir William Herschel called it the Garnet Star. You can't, I'm afraid, see the color easily with the naked eye. It's not very far above naked eye visibility. But use binoculars, and Mu Cephei looks rather like a glowing coal. And in fact, there's another huge red supergiant, more than 50,000 times more luminous than our sun, and something like 1,600 light years away. And in fact, Mu Cephei is a great deal more powerful than the red supergiant in Orion, Betelgeuse, which almost everyone knows. Now, after all, Orion does dominate the evening sky now. And there's a star trail of picture of Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse in the upper left-hand corner of the constellation. And if you take that kind of a picture, uh, you will see the colors coming out very well. But Betelgeuse really is huge. The Earth is 93 million miles from the Sun. Therefore, the diameter of the Earth's orbit is 186 million miles. And the body of Betelgeuse is, in fact, larger than that, something like 250 million miles. So it is really huge. Although, of course, it's not so dense as the sun, the outer layers are very, very fine. But it's more than 15,000 times as bright as the sun. And also, Betelgeuse is decidedly variable. And this year, it's been very bright, almost as bright as the other star in Orion, 
of which is Rigel. And there the diagonal around, the Detelgeuse on the upper left, and Rigel in the lower right. And Rigel is a cosmic searchlight, something like 60,000 times more luminous than our own sun. And normally, much brighter than Betelgeuse, but this year, Betelgeuse has in fact rivaled it. In mythology, Orion was a great hunter, with a sword and a belt, as you can see from there. And the belt is made up of three bright stars in the line, and below the belt, you can see Orion's sword as a misty patch. You can see it quite clearly with the naked eye, and binoculars bring it out very well indeed. And here are some lovely pictures taken by David Malin in Australia, a mass of dust and gas more than a thousand light years away. And in fact, M42 is a, a region where stars are being born. It's a celestial nursery. And it's being lit up by the stars of what we call Theta Orionis, the trapezium, and there they are right in the middle of the picture. And with our telescope, you can see those four stars very clearly. There are many gaseous nebulae in the sky, but I think Orion's sword is the most magnificent and is very well on view now. Let's go back now to Orion's belt and take a line downwards. And you'll come then to the brightest star in the sky, which is Sirius, the dog star, in Canis Major, the great dog. And it's far brighter than any other star. But appearances are rather deceptive. Rigel, as I've said, is 60,000 sun power. Sirius is only 26 sun power. And it owes its eminence to the fact that it's comparatively close to us. In fact, one of our very nearest stellar neighbors, only eight and a half light years away. So we're seeing Sirius as it was eight and a half years ago, Rigel as it was 900 years ago. Now Sirius is in fact a pure white star, but look at it and it appears to twinkle and flash various colors. Star twinkling has nothing definite to do with the stars themselves. It's purely an effect of the Earth's dirty, unsteady atmosphere. When a star is high up, it doesn't twinkle much. When a star is low down, it twinkles very markedly because the light's coming to us through a much denser layer of the Earth's atmosphere. All stars do twinkle to some extent, but Sirius shows it particularly, partly because it is so brilliant, and partly because, as seen from here, it's never very high up. It's well south of the celestial equator. Incidentally, it's not a solitary traveler in space. It has a companion. And because Sirius is known as the dog star, the companion's often known as the pup. And there's a picture of the pup. You can see it at that point just above Sirius. Those spikes, of course, are purely photographic effects. And I must say, it's a very curious pup indeed. It's an old, bankrupt star that's used up its main sources of energy, called the White Dwarf, and now shining merely because it's contracting very slowly. And although it's smaller than a planet such as Neptune, it is as massive as the Sun. And take White Dwarf material, you go back more than a ton of it into an egg cup. So it's a very strange thing indeed. Also near Sirius, they're the first of our winter star clusters. This is M41. M, by the way, stands for Messier, because the catalogue of these things was drawn up way back in 1781 by the French astronomer Charles Messier. So there's M41, which is a very nice open cluster. You can just see it with the naked eye, and that's the kind of binocular view we have in it. Frankly, it's best seen, I think, with binoculars, but it's rather scattered, and with a telescope, you don't see it all at once. But if you want a really lovely cluster, then come back to Orion, follow the line of the belt up, come to the constellation Taurus with the bright star on Debron, and then the marvelous cluster of the Pleiades, or Seven Sisters, the most famous open cluster in the entire sky. This is a picture I took of it, kind of a snapshot with an ordinary telephoto lens, and you can see various stars there. And in fact, people with ordinary eyes on a dark, clear night can see seven individual stars. Some people can see more than that. But when you use a telescope in photography, you can see that the cluster really is very populous. And there's a picture of the Pleiades, and note there the nebulosity, indicating that the cluster is fairly young by cosmic standards, and probably their star formation is still going on. Also in Taurus, the bull, we have a different kind of a cluster. Again, follow up the line of Orion's belt, and come to the red Aldebaran, the eye of the bull, which looks rather like Betelgeuse, not nearly so luminous or not, ne not nearly so large. And extending away from Aldebaran is the rather scattered cluster of the Hyades, again, I think, best seen with binoculars. But in fact, appearances are deceptive. Now that picture shows Aldebaran over to the left and the stars of the Hyades, but Aldebaran is not really a member of the cluster at all. It lies just about halfway between the cluster and ourselves, so it's merely a line of sight effect. And in a way, I think that's rather unfortunate, because the bright orange light of Aldebaran rather drowned the cluster but the high ideas are certainly worthwhile looking at. And still in Taurus, one fascinating object. 
Let's find the star Zeta Tauri, more than a third magnitude star, and close to that is M1, the Crab Nebula, which you can't see with the naked eye. Powerful binoculars just show it, and the telescope shows it as a patch of gas. In fact, it was observed way back in 1845 by the third Earl of Ross, who built a huge 72-inch telescope at Burr Castle in Ireland, and there it is. I may say it has now been brought back into use for the first time since 1909. And with that, Lord Ross made a drawing of the Crab Nebula. This, of course, was long before the days of photography. Uh, and uh, in fact, now I mean to compare that drawing with a modern photograph, you'll agree that Lord Ross got it pretty well right. And in fact, we now know that the Crab Nebula is not an ordinary nebula. It's the remnant of a supernova, a star which was seen to blow up way back in the year 1054. Taurus the bull is joined onto the adjacent constellation, Auriga the charioteer, by the second magnitude star, Alnath. In fact, Alnath used to be included in Auriga, and they are being given a free transfer to Taurus. Auriga itself is marked by the brilliant yellow star Capella, almost overhead in winter evenings, a lovely star. It's an easy constellation to find, and there are three excellent star clusters there, M36, 37, and 38 all nice binocular objects, and here, in fact, is a picture of M38. And another good cluster is found in the constellation of the twins, Gemini, marked by the two stars, Castor and Pollux. And there is M35, again, a naked eye object, and this is a picture of it, and it's quite condensed. But I think an even better cluster is M44, Chrysippe, in the constellation of Cancer, the Crab. And Chrysippe is easily visible with the naked eye, and on a clear night, it's a magnificent object. And there is a view of it, as you will see it in binoculars. Chrysippe and Cancer adjoin Leo, the lion, which is a very easy constellation to find, with one first magnitude star, Regulus. You can locate it by using the pointers in the Great Bear the wrong way, so to speak, and they'll lead you straight to the sickle of Leo. One more object. Come back to the W of Cassiopeia, and use two of the stars to show the way to the sword handle in Perseus. And that again, you can see it with the naked eye, it looks rather like a rich port of the Milky Way, but we're not going to show it well, and telescopically it is a lovely sight. It is two clusters close together in the sky, and there's nothing else quite like that. So the sword handle of Perseus is certainly something that you should look at. We're not going to show it well, and the telescope gives a superb view. So all in all, I think you'll agree, there is plenty of interest to see in the winter sky, particularly if you equip yourself with binoculars or a small telescope. And on the whole, frankly, I'd rather have binoculars. Don't forget, it's newsletter time. If you want a letter, then send your stamp to this envelope to newsletter number 60, The Sky at Night, BBC TV, London w 70 s or you can, of course, dial up CFAX, page 615. And if you want the latest astronomical information, then call up our information line, 0891 800 330. And um, when I come back next month, I'm going to ask you, um, what's the matter? Uh, between the stars, I mean. Good night. <laughs>